so uh, so uh, welcome tonight. Um, I'd like to thank the Davis Futures Forum for arranging this event, and I'd like to thank uh, John and uh, Greg for uh, being our uh, our guests who will be uh, enlightening us on a variety of things. I have a little prepared script to go over, but uh, before I do that, uh, I find this typically very annoying, but I, I'm standing on this side of the microphone, I can see why they do that. How about everyone sort of scoots over here and we kind of fill in and make it kind of cozy and we can all kind of look at this screen. Uh, I think that'll be uh, just a lot nicer for the presenters and I think it'll make it nicer for the discussion. If there's a large surge of people who come in, we'll uh, open up the other section. Um, so John Godden is a publishing editor of Canada's Better Builder magazine. He has developed his expertise over the last 30 years, first as a builder of energy efficient homes and then as a consultant and raider to builders and renovators of sustainable homes, designers and manufacturers. He has participated in the creation of an energy efficient building rating system, including LEED. Godin has a unique perspective that gives him a pragmatic and hands-on approach to sustainable home building because he knows what works and what doesn't work. And joining him will be Greg Mahoney. He's the chi chief building official for the city of Davis and chair of the energy advisory committee for the California Energy Commission. Greg and John will have spent the afternoon together and so uh, it'll be curious to to hear sort of what sort of they've worked on. Uh, you know, you put two people, well-educated, knowledgeable people who have a lot of practical experience, but also kind of, you know, of looking at the boundaries of practice. You put them in a room together, it's, uh, you know, a lot of times really good things happen. So I, I know that I'm personally interested in hearing what they have to say. And uh, I think it's really wonderful that the Davis Futures Forum has been putting on these events because we can actually see a direct line in terms of the people who came and spoke and some of the things we're doing. We see a direct line, for instance, as we work on our downtown uh, plan, basically the general plan for the downtown. Several ideas that were brought forward to us from the Davis Futures Forum are directly being uh, implemented with that. But without uh, further delay, uh, I'm gonna hand the microphone over to John and uh, um, right. you know, thank you for being here. Can, can everybody hear me without the mic? Um, so thank you very much. Are you recording? Oh, great. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me, Chris? Okay. I always feel like a bit of a game show host with this. So, uh, so thanks for the opportunity, Mayor, to speak. Um, I, I must say this afternoon, we, we had another... Um, engagement at uh, Indigo uh, Architects, which was very enlightening for me, um, because we do actually live in different climates. So um, I want to go back to my graduating year in university, University of Waterloo. Uh, I did my senior honors thesis on a rural self-sufficient self subdivision. And uh, one of the case studies just happened to be village homes. So two years ago when we were visiting, um, we came to visit uh, Wendy, my partner's here. And she's, she's actually the publishing editor of Better Builder magazine. Um, so we went there to visit with her brother-in-law. And I started poking around and walking around. And I knew the place. I knew it was village homes just from my studies, and um, was lucky enough to meet up with Judy Corbett, and it was an inspiration for me, so I'm largely here uh, because of what Judy and Michael Corbett and all the other people helped them achieve with Village Homes. It is an inspiration. So I'm here doing what I usually do. Back home, I challenge builders. Are there any home builders in the room? Any builders? There's not one builder. Okay. So usually what I do is I challenge builders to build better. And we're in very similar situations because California has a leading energy code. 
Uh, so does the province that I come from, the province of Ontario. But we're, I'm also bringing a challenge from the mayor of East Gwillenbury to have a friendly cross-border competition to see how energy and water efficient we can get a demonstration home in Davis. So that's the challenge. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the technologies that we use in Canada, and they may be appropriate down here. Um, I just want to underscore that with I'm learning lots about the difference in climate. So um, hopefully it will be helpful. Um, so I basically started off after planning school as a low energy builder. And one of the names of one of the companies I have is ClearSphere. So that's a consultancy. And I help production builders build very low energy homes. And I myself was one of the first R2000 builders in Canada. And R2000 was building the home of the millennia in 1984. So I built my first low energy house in uh, 1985. And when I build as a custom builder, I would do the designs, do the mechanicals, and actually frame the houses, and do a lot of the work on them, and probably do two of them a year. So the ClearSphere house was a light gauge steel house that was built for a couple that were chemically sensitive. Um, I started to, I've worked on about five houses for people that had multiple chemical sensitivities. And we were using the steel because it was relatively clean. It didn't have forming oil on it. We're using uh, water-based insulation, so I don't know how well you can make out the, uh, the uh, polyisonine going in there, which is a water-based foam. And uh, back then, actually using uh, solar thermal technology. So I personally have installed about uh, solar thermal on about 150 houses. Um, so the challenge is coming from East Gwillenbury, who initially had a mandatory approach of requiring builders to build every house to Energy Star. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with what Energy Star is. Um, and I had a hand in writing the Canadian version of Energy Star, and it's about 20% better than the American version. So it's just like this hockey thing. I'm <laughs> rubbing it in a little bit. Um, and so what I'm very interested in, and I talked to, to Greg, is uh, California is just about to adopt uh, an, a performance standard for energy efficiency. So conveniently, you people will be using exactly what I'm using now. So it's a great sort of way to, uh, to get this comparison if we can find a builder. So no builders snuck in while I was... And we're actually trying to get everybody over to the right here. Is that possible? And that's not my directive, that's the mayor's directive, so. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, good. Okay. So any subdivision over uh, 10 homes roughly had to be 20% uh, better than the prevailing code. Um, so I was involved with a incentive program by another municipality that offered builders lots at a preferred rate because the city owned the land. Sorry about that. And um, the outcome of that was all during the process we were consulting with uh, all the stakeholders. Lead was just coming to Canada. I was sworn by the builder not to mention Lead. The mayor of Newmarket basically said, well, we would like you to do this Lead thing. And by the way, this other municipality over here has already built a Lead Platinum home. And the builder stood up and said, I'm going to build all 34 of those to Lead Platinum. So it's this whole thing about, about challenge and engaging builders that want to do well. So 34 lead platinum homes in 2008, and not quite as high as you got, Dick, but every house was 96 points, which for a production builder was quite an accomplishment. Um, Dick's building actually has the highest, one of the highest point totals, right? Yeah, OK. So on my 50th birthday, I 
started challenging production builders to get 50 homes that were 50% better than code. And I got a few more than 50. And I'm probably at about maybe 7,000. Um, so that's been very successful. So I just had my 60th birthday, so I didn't challenge uh, builders to get to uh, whatever, six million, but anyways. So, um, so again, this R2000 program, government program, very successful for creating movement for building codes, but also builders could have a container for showing off leading edge technologies. And in uh, 2006, I worked with other consultants to write the Canadian version of Energy Star, uh, version four. I worked on Lead for Homes. That's how we got into the 30 floor Lead Platinum houses. And then in 2012, our provincial building code adopted an energy code performance standard in it. Um, so in 2012, we were building a HERS 60. And I'm going to show you a scale, what that sort of looks like. Um, so back to East Gwillenberry, where the challenge is coming from. They actually offered on the bottom there in black developers 28% more uh, coverage or more lots if they actually met these higher performance standards. And so the unintended consequence of that was developers ticked a box off, and then the builders had to do the undertaking. <laughs> so the builder would have to buy the lots, and he, the developer could sell them more lots, but he had the undertaking of about $5,000 a house to meet all these, these checklists. So again, I'm just trying to point out this idea of um, engaging builders at the front end. And in our market, many uh, builders have become developers, so they don't actually get stuck with some of these things at the tail end of the process. Okay, so there's all these energy requirements, but what happened when it was drafted is it became antiquated within a couple of years. So all the best practices they chose from LEED by the time it was published, we're sort of old business. So part of this challenge, and it's in the magazine and I have copies of it, was to encourage the municipality through a challenge with the mayor to rethink what these features were on the house and come up with a checklist. Um, so anybody that knows LEED will, will recognize this, but um, this is basically a water efficiency checklist from LEED, and that's what they had to do. But many of my builders actually wanted to do better stuff, and the stuff that wasn't on the list. So this whole thing became um, sort of a challenge for this builder to show the municipality all these other technologies that were available to them to build better than what the ask was. Um, so some of the other things I've worked on, and we have very good success building voluntary um, projects. This is actually um, five houses, but the three on the left, they're called the teeth houses, three energy efficient houses. So bringing together manufacturers and everybody, the local municipality in a collaboration to do these demonstration houses. And the one right over here is called the hybrid house. So it's a low carbon net zero cost house. So all the measures in it are actually monetized to make sure that they can be paid for on a mortgage when they're amortized over 25 years. So in our market, we don't talk necessarily about net zero. Uh, I'll move over here a bit, so I'll include you guys. Um, we actually talk about low carbon. And I know there's a lot of talk about zero emissions or zero carbon houses. I actually don't know what that is. So I'm always asking people, can you give me a definition? So again, part of this challenge is to find out sort of what that is. Um, but in a nutshell, on the hybrid house, compared to the National Building Code, the, the metric became, how do we get this house footprint down to metric tons? So in Canada, we have metric tons. 
of CO2 emissions. And to normalize that, I guess nobody's playing hockey down here, but that's a hockey arena full of CO2. And that's what the house is producing in a year. Um, and then another engagement, much like I'm hoping to do here, where the municipality asks three builders to come in and have a workshop and decide about all the technologies that they want to show off and actually sell. So they're going to educate their homeowners enough to actually buy them, which is an innovation. Um, so what I've been doing for the last 10 years is challenging American builders and Canadian builders, and it's a friendly competition. It's not winners and losers. The border's in the middle. Everybody gets to look at what everybody's doing to see how low we can go on a HERS rating. Uh, so here's the challenge, Mr. Mayor. The town of East Gwillimbury would like to extend a friendly challenge to the city of Davis, California. The challenge is for Davis to build a demonstration home using the HERS energy rating system, which builders will be using very shortly, and the HERS H2O water scale, which actually includes, and it's an ANSI standard, indoor and outdoor water use, so it might be a useful index, and to create a platform or a checklist to promote the construction of energy efficient, durable, and water conserving homes in both localities. So uh, is anybody wondering why I'm trying to do this? Do you want to ask me formally why I'm trying to do this? Why would you do this? I, I'm doing this because of this coincidence with Village Homes. So I, I came here, stayed, saw it, something that inspired me. So I'm actually bringing that inspiration back. And I'm hoping that we can do something collaboratively. Okay, so here's how we start the engagement. There's no builders in the room, right? So there is? Great, that's why you're sitting over there all by yourself? Good, okay. So how do we get a group of builders up on a roof? We have, how much time do we have? <laughs> and the, the joke is, we tell them lunch is on the house. <laughs> Boo, okay. Okay, so this is, this is where the discussion starts across the aisle, okay? There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? We, we have to figure out how to pay for all these extra goodies. And that's, that's what we're gonna try and arrive at. So the very first stage of this whole thing is not, you gotta do this, it's engagement, right? So is that a good enough answer to your question? I'm here to engage. Okay, so the most important part of engagement is there's got to be choice. And the other part of this thing is making sure that we have an, a, a knowledge base, but also an understanding through experience of what works and what doesn't work. Because many times what's on the shelf and again, some municipalities in my backyard are just referencing lead. And Greg and I have talked a little bit about that. I'm of the opinion that instead of paying for the certification, we should take that money from you and invest it in the house, if that's what we want to do. Because it's relatively expensive to do that, right? But there's this whole thing about technology sort of offering us these magic bullets and there's all this rhetoric about net zero carbon or zero emissions or net zero energy and I don't know what that is. I'm being totally honest with you and I've been at this for a while. Dick, do you have any answers? Okay. <laughs> Keep engaging? Okay. So um, just a quick uh, sort of a couple of words about leadership and John Quincy Adams, a great American, fit this into less than 20 words. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. And leadership drives the change. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Nothing great happens without leadership. One does not claim leadership. Others refer to leaders as such. 
Okay? And my challenge in my own market is that we've had the change in government that you've had in the United States. We've gone from a very liberal government that was going to be net zero by 2030, and our code's driving like that, stepping towards that, to just trying to harmonize between uh, provinces and the national building code, which means that in my market, builders will be waiting for everyone to catch up. And so one of the other reasons I'm here is this is a great story to take back with me, where I can challenge them and say, people I talk to in California are doing much better than you guys. And that's, believe it or not, how I've had success. I challenge builders to do better, but I need somebody to, for them to look up to. So flexibility and uh, equivalency. So again, Greg, you were saying that your uh, city requirements were possibly looking for lead or equivalent, right? I think it's very good to keep it open-ended, so no sole sourcing programs. And what I'm really interested in is getting the right people in the room, but not downloading onto you, so you don't have to pick, the, pick up the tab. And by the way, I did buy dinner for everybody tonight, so. And I like to think of myself as a builder, but I'm a recovering builder, so. <laughs> okay, so, so how do we do this? The municipality wants something, builders have needs, and he just said it, they want something. So what's the carrot? It's likely, I think, um, an expedited building permit or a clear path to what it is you want them to do. And again, um, Greg, in our, in our discussions is some of these uh, documents that we have to navigate, uh, normal mortals cannot understand them, right? So we've got to make it really clear, and I'm suggesting that that is a checklist. So um, the Paris Accord, um, has everybody seen Al Gore's second movie, Truth to Power? Wendy and I actually saw it here two years ago, which was really good at the movie theater. But Al Gore was responsible for a lot of this, the inception of the, the Paris Accord. And so the Paris Accord is trying to get us all to these different stages by 2020. So in 2020, which is uh, not that far away, uh, the Paris Accord is wanting everybody to reduce their emissions to 15% less than 1990 levels, okay? So our building code, and believe it or not, before I published this in the magazine and showed it to the Ministry of Housing, had not figured out that we were already 44% better than 1990 levels right now. So we're exceeding that substantially, right? So, um, it's pointing out this whole thing about sort of mapping out where we are. And again, that's one of the, the reasons I'm here. We have a way uh, through the HERS index that you people could be using in less than a year um, just for cross-referencing these houses. Uh, in my market, so I'm gonna just go through some of the, the challenges that we have in a cold climate because it is a different scenario from what uh, you people experience down here. But the, uh, the choice for heating, space heating and hot water in my market is natural gas. And if it's not fracked, it actually is the lowest carbon choice next to electricity. Um, I pointed this out today, and Dick, actually I'm gonna say this the right way now. Uh, Can Canada's per capita uh, emissions of CO2 are more than the US's, okay? And there's, there's reasons for that. Um, it's probably the tar sands and the fact that there's a few people in a lot of space, right? So um, the province that I come from, Ontario, has 40% of the population. It's growing really fast because of immigration. Uh, we build 50% of the houses, but the whole population of Canada is less than California. 
You're about 39 million and we're 37. The whole nation of Canada has less population than California. The challenge with California to actually go carbon free is that a lot of your electricity comes from natural gas. So that's, that's a huge challenge. In my market, where Wendy and I live, 26% comes from Niagara Falls, so hydroelectric power, but 60% 60 comes from nuclear power plants, which we can't turn off. So at night, we actually have stranded capacity. And we did this session today, and people were sort of smiling about how low our electricity rates are. So at peak demand, we're paying 13.2 cents. And I'll just rub it a little bit more. Remember, our dollar is worth like way less than yours, <laughs> about 35% less. But at night, it is relatively cheap. So we have this opportunity, likely through battery storage, and that's the key threshold. 14 cents actually makes a power wall work in a house that saves electricity off peak. So we're in this whole scenario of trying to figure out what the big offsets are for a house. And we are actually at the point, which California might be, of diminishing marginal returns from adding any envelope features to a house. It makes no sense to have walls that are two feet thick, right? And in my definition of sustainability, that's really using, if you're using too many resources to get an effect, I'm always doing cost benefit stuff, right? And one of the issues, the problems with doing that is natural gas is extremely cheap in our market. But the house I'm gonna show you, the CO2 emissions or the footprint is five metric tons. And so if we got one car off the road, that could actually offset that house. And we have a lot of surplus electricity. I'm gonna go right by that one, cause it, no, you know what? I'm gonna talk about it, cause it's controversial. Um, I took it out today cause there was a solar panel guy in the room. But solar panels, the way that a lot of them are made, take four years before they actually are net. Because they have a lot of embodied energy in them. Okay? Especially if they come from China and they're made in uh, electrical kilns that are fired by coal. So those panels never make back, this is an energy thing. If we're talking about CO2, you've got to know where your panels are coming from. So a lot of them that are made domestically don't have that issue. But I'm just pointing that out because um, I think the answer is a multi-pronged approach to many different fuels, fuel switching. Okay, so we've talked a lot about energy. I'm gonna move over to water. And again, Canada and the US are right up there with using water and the thing that we were trying to figure out today was if we go over to water for human use, America is almost 20 times what Canada is for personal use. And I think uh, much of this could be irrigation for um, agriculture, right? I, I, I don't know the answer for that. I'm just putting it up there as, as a point of interest. So, here's the technology that we use north of the border in a cold climate. And this is eight technologies that were put together and they're called the Total Water Solution. And I have a nice video and I have handouts if anybody wants to look at that. I think the only person in the room that might understand it is Dick. Anybody else understand what's on there? There's a, there's a lot of information on there. It, the more the merrier, so that's good. I have handouts, so I don't mean to diminish anybody's um, awareness, but I'm, I'm just gonna break it down because there's energy and water. And so what we're doing because of our surplus of cheap electricity at night is we're using combination hybrid heat. So we're wisely using natural gas on very low load houses 
to provide space heating and hot water. And then off-peak electricity is used with a heat pump at night in the shoulder months to offset the carbon from the natural gas-fired equipment. So this is basically a tankless hot water heater or a boiler or a condensing hot water tank that's providing space heating and hot water heating. So on the water side, our code actually mandates drain water heat recovery. And again, there'll be a nice little video that'll show everybody how this works. Two showers saves enough water in this gray water recycling unit. And we have somebody here from Greater who can if anybody has some interest, can talk to after the fact. But we can do all the toilet flushing for a family of four off saved shower water. Okay, So we take the shower, we take 50% of the heat out of it, and we save that water to flush toilets. We actually have leak detection here because we don't want to waste any of the water. We don't actually want to use ultra-low flush toilets because we're saving water. We need a way to use it which is a little bit of an irony. And we're using structured plumbing. So many people today were sort of talking about how they waste water when they're waiting for the hot water to get to the top. They're just running it. So a structured plumbing system actually creates smaller pipe running to each fixture, and there's not as much wait time. It reduces it by up to 50%. Okay. So. Promising technology that you're going to start to see if you want to go to electricity is these um, heat pump hot water heaters. And so they're basically uh, using a heat pump to preheat hot water. And they work at about, it's a coefficient of performance of about 2.5. So one unit of electricity goes in, 2.45 units of heat comes out. The issue with them is they have very low recovery rates. So if somebody takes a long shower, the next person doesn't get it. But again, this technology, and this is, this is one of the offers that I'm bringing to the cross-border challenge with Davis, is one of these drain water units that can recover the heat and preheat this hot water tank and actually um, improve its recovery rate almost fourfold, because it's a preheat. So it's using the heat from the shower water to preheat the water that's coming in, and it's raising the recovery rate of the tank. So gray water, again, is two showers a day, which accounts for 25 to 30% of the water usage indoor. I know there's a lot of water used outdoors here for irrigation. This is indoor use. Um, actually offsets the toilets. Okay, so here's a nice little video, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this remotely because I have to click the screen on the computer. Is it up here? Oh, yeah, good. Now I'm feeling really important. This is where the important people sit, right? Okay, so there's a mouse here. Okay, this is about three minutes long. Do we have sound? Nope. Is there any way we can get sound, Alan? Pardon? Sound button on the left. Microphone. Oh, is this a laptop? I can't find anything. So maybe on here? Is it down here? I can't really see that much. Is that where it is? Up right. Oh, it's up. Yeah, we just got to get the. Is it coming from the projector? Is there a remote for the projector? Here it is. Um, 
These are just screens. There's a central CPU somewhere. So is there any sound on here? I don't want to touch the power button, keystone, menu. We might have to do this again. Okay, well, I'm going to run the video because then you can see what's happening. And maybe I'll describe that. How does that sound? Okay, so back up here. You, if, if you get a small diameter one, people have actually tried to put it horizontal. It, it actually works. But all the testing is done on them vertically. Okay, so let's watch this. Okay. So the animation will just show you how it works. And again, um, so Kelly's here from Greater. In states like California, there's actually where water is scarce. There's uh, incentives because of high tap fees to actually put the system in. So there's the shower water offsetting the toilet water. Okay. Okay, so the water's going from the shower into the grater, and two showers a day is flushing the toilets. So here's the water being saved in the tank, and this is an anti-fouling valve. Um, it's actually a backwash, so hair is the biggest enemy of any gray water system connected to a shower. But um, it has a special filter in it that's uh, microorganism resistant. And um, it actually takes out all the soaps and surfactants. And it uses household chlorine to actually um, purify the water. That's an overflow valve in case you save too much. Um, here's a city water connection. There's a bypass in it, so if you need to service it, you can actually bypass it. It's the size of a, there's Judy's car, her hybrid, right Judy, in the garage? And there's all the connections. So it's completely self-contained, uses household chlorine, and it's got absorption cartridges, so there's carbon cartridges that you could add if you want higher water quality. And there's an interface that tells the homeowner exactly what it's doing. But this can be done uh, remotely to troubleshoot it. I think that's right. It can all be done on Wi-Fi. Yeah. OK, here's how it works in conjunction with the drain water heat recovery. So the heat is going to preheat the tankless hot water heater or the electric hot water tank. And um, then the water is actually being saved in the greater system to flush toilets. And there's the offset. Well, and I, I've got a slide coming up. So our, our code is actually asking for two showers on the drain water recovery. So it's not that much more work to isolate the gray water on two showers. And then it's really just providing half inch packs, purple packs to the toilets. You're going to have to ask him. Yeah, uh, if you're talking about multiple single family homes being built, it's about $4,500 all installed. The clicker. Uh, well, it's 50 gallons uh, basically per day. Uh, hours, and then that's used for both. You're really fast on that math, Alan. Yeah. Like, OK, so again, and we, we have many builders that are actually roughing this in. And I think that's something else, Greg, that people are considering, right? Is roughing in gray water systems for later on?
Actually, even on the state level, in fact, the, the Department of Water Resources submitted a code change proposal to include fire uh, dual plumbing for recycled water use inside the house. Right. So either gray water or recycled water. Okay. So there's there's what it sort of looks like if it's roughed in. There's uh, these purple PEX lines that are running to two toilets. There's this bypass loop so that the unit could accept the water here and actually have an overflow. Um, there's sort of what it looks like on a two-story house, on a slab on grade. So the gray water from the showers needs to be isolated from the black water. And there's the PEX runs. So the question was how much to rough in? Is that where you're you asked me a question about uh, I don't I don't think it's really being presented as that. I think there's um, and getting back to what's in it for the builder, normally there's some sort of an incentive. So again, in Colorado, if they can get their water demand down to a certain level, they actually get a cash payment per house, right? Is that right, Kelly? Looking at the, so there's different ways of incentivizing. So it could be a rebate, it could be a cash rebate, or it could also be uh, being able to get faster or cheaper permits for, a, a, like if you're doing multiple houses, like 100 or other large development. Um, or the tap fees if, uh, for getting that water for both your, your fresh water in and then dealing with the water out, uh, that can have a substantial cost to, to each home and the home builder. So that's where the economics can come out saving 20% of your water use per home uh, multiplied by all the homes, then you're, you're looking at a, a much lower tap fee, which then is how it, it's uh, currently how it's paying for it. So. Okay, so here, here's the logic plumbing again. And um, the way that this works on the hot water side is that we're getting the water, hot water delivered faster so people don't have to run it and waste water down the drain. Um, Okay, so let's get back to the challenge, and I, I've got to do this quick because the big hook is going to come and pull me off the, the podium soon. I've got to give Greg enough time. So International Energy Code, which uh, you're going to be sort of possibly adopting, has your houses at a 51. Uh, our code in Zone 6 is a 54. Uh, I have another video that's likely not going to work, so I'm going to just go to the next stage. So here's the award-winning house of the cross-border challenge that has the total water solution in it that was sponsored by Enbridge. Um, so I'm not going to take that house and ship it down here and compare it. We're actually going to use the software to compare the houses. And if I take that house and I plop it down in Davis in zone three, Here's how the scores sort of come out. So hers 41, and again, hers is the home energy rating scale. We don't have the video on there, but the typical 2006 house is 100. And California and my locality are down to about 50. And these houses are coming in at 20 or 25% better. If we switch the heating plant over to electric, with an electric hot water heater um, and a heat pump air conditioner, the score actually goes up. So one of the things that the index does is it likes primary energy. So this goes to the fact that natural gas, even though it is a carbon emitting fuel, is a primary energy. Electricity is secondary and it's actually made from other things. So electricity is only a primary fuel when it's coming off the roof or it's coming from a hydro dam. But I can tell you that if you wanted to get to what hers is calling zero energy, you would have to put 13 kilowatts on the roof of this house, which is a lot. And generally, when we try and get to net zero on these bigger production homes, we don't have enough roof area to put the panels on. 
So again, that's why I was making the comment. I, I don't actually know how to do this on some of the houses I'm working on. Uh, but the good news is, if you uh, built this house in Davis and you used a uh, heat pump hot water heater with drain water heat recovery, you could take that down three or four points. And it is a carbon neutral fuel if that's coming from solar panels. Okay, so apples to apples comparison. We've got a lot of people that want to use natural gas. We can't really get off of that. My strategy has been using off-peak electricity in battery storage, and we're just about to get at our office like a Tesla Powerwall, so we can run our office during the day on off-peak electricity. So that's been our strategy. And then we have a company car that's a um, plug-in hybrid, much like some of you people have down here. But our heating load in a cold climate, we actually need a gas-fired system. Um, our air conditioning loads, so your load is sort of like half because you don't get as cold here. Um, the air conditioning load obviously is, is lower because our cooling degree days are a quarter of what yours are. Surprise, surprise. And different weather zones. So back to the good builder score. Just the idea to get a bunch of builders, architects, stakeholders in a room and decide what this checklist looks like. And I have some of these checklists if people want them. I have handouts of the total water solution if people want those as well. And um, again, we use uh, a limited amount of solar sometimes, up to seven kilowatts, to get to what we're calling low carbon net zero cost houses. Uh, so again, I'll just go through the challenge quickly, trying to get um, a builder in Davis. So there's a builder back there. Hello? Oh, you're looking at the screen too. Okay. Okay, good. And we can get you a copy of the presentation. But um, if, if you decide to do this on a house, uh, Greater will offer you assistance under certain conditions for monitoring. We're trying to use the HERS H2O scale, which is a very new uh, thing that we're trying to pilot. And uh, there's drain water heat recovery, um, a unit if you have a two-story house and you want to use that. And so uh, consult and collaborate and then construct the home. And then the fourth step is show it off and try and do something. So here's Victoria Haxon, the male, mayor of East Gwillimbury at an opening. This works very well in, in our locality. And the biggest part of this for me was to actually get the town to put in equivalency. So this is just a sample of one of their energy efficiency um, forms in their checklist, which is pretty exhaustive. So it was asking for Energy Star mandatory, and this other builder is now able to use um, hers to do it there. And uh, at the end, the waterless toast. So Greg, you're up. And I think I did that in a little bit over 40 minutes, but Perfect. there you go. I don't need it. Oh, you don't? OK, you're just you're going to talk. I am. But you have to use this, because yeah. we're recording. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, So my name is Greg Mahoney, and I'm the building official here. And I was asked to just come and talk and, and tell you kind of where we are now and, and how we got here and, and go through the different ordinances and, and make some resolutions that got us to this point. Um, we are currently using a different, I guess, a different metric to um, determine energy efficiency than, than they do in Canada. That they're using the, the, um, the HERS rating or the um, energy design rating is what the California Energy Commission calls it. And um, I think that that's a good way to go. The Energy Commission, what they've done over the last many years um, is they establish an energy budget uh, based on the size of the house. And, and um, so you have to meet an energy budget. And um, so then when communities like ours want to, you know, um, pass or, or propose a reach code, 
rather than say, okay, from this, you know, say a 60 on the um, EDR rating, we want everyone to comply with a 50, we end up having to say, okay, we, we're going to require a 10% compliance margin, so 10% better. Um, so the Energy Commission has recognized the value in rather than, than rewriting, you know, their software pa um, every time that they just say, okay, this is the energy design rating that you're going to have to achieve to be code compliant. And coming up in uh, January 1st, 2020, we are going to have um, an energy design rating. A code compliant building will be somewhere between 30 and 40, depending on whether it has gas or, or electricity, like John had mentioned. The houses that are electric only um, don't score as well on, on, the, um, on the rating. And um, I know it's kind of unfortunate, I guess, for, for some people because a lot of, there's kind of this desire to get to, um, all electric buildings. But um, right now, the way it's set up, it, the um, compliance really favors a house that also incorporates gas. And so um, another requirement that John kind of touched upon about cost effectiveness, one of the requirements in the California Energy Code is that any energy efficiency measures have to be found to be cost effective over the, a 30-year mortgage. And so that's, that's something that was written into the Warren Alquist Act in 1976 or something, I think is when it was passed. Um, and so any energy efficiency measures that we want to adopt or incorporate it into our um, municipal code, we have to demonstrate cost effectiveness and um, some, you know, that can be expensive, but fortunately we're in a climate right now, and I don't mean our physical climate, but um, political climate where um, even, you know, PG&E recognizes the, um, the value in energy efficiency. And so they, their codes and standards group typically pay for these cost effectiveness studies that we can utilize in, in our energy efficiency ordinances. So um, I just want to kind of run through where we are, how we got here. Um, City of Davis is really a leader um, in energy efficiency. They had an energy code um, in the mid-70s before the state of California had an energy code. And we also had um, council adopted a resale program. I don't know, we, ne we didn't talk about the resale program. We should. It's, it's kind of a really innovative program that is um, challenging to administer. Um, there's a lot of different groups, Energy Commission, a lot of different groups are interested in our, our resale program because they see it as a way to further energy efficiency. And so when you sell your house in Davis, you have to um, come in and, and pay for a, an inspection, time of sale inspection. So we look for things that um, are, are maybe done without permit. And so the benefit is twofold. One, there was an energy efficiency component associated with that ordinance, and that is that if you had a house that was built before 1978, you may not have had any attic insulation, so you're required to retrofit with R19. That's what the ordinance said back in 1976 or whatever it was. But the other, um, I think, and what many people see as really valuable part of that ordinance is that people get permits. And so when people get permits, then they comply, you know, they're kind of forced to comply with the code, including the energy code. In fact, I've um, been working with the Energy Commission, and um, they did some studies and found that somewhere, be they did two studies. One found that 8% of the people who do HVAC changeouts get permits. The other one said 10%. So that's, a lot of people don't get permits, which means then there are all these requirements like duct sealing, refrigerant charge, and airflow, and fan watt draw that are required to verify at time of HVAC changeout. Well, just to, um, you know, they asked, well, what about you and your resale program? What kind of compliance rates do you get? So we went back three years and looked at all of our um, resale inspections. That was 1,700 of them. And 95% of them got permits for HVAC change out. So it's a really effective program. Um, like I said, it's not easy to administer. But anyway, that's our resale program. Um, and like I said, the resale program back in the mid-'70s had an energy efficiency component to it. And I don't know, maybe folks like Dick, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but I could probably fill in the blanks between mid-1970s and now, because I started with the city of Davis in 2006, so I know what's happened since 2006. So um, in 2008, I was asked to write a, um, a green building ordinance. And um, I really, I guess I have to thank um, 
city of Davis for kind of forcing me into this position because it forced me to become really kind of um, educated in regards to green building and energy efficiency. And so I became lead AP and HERS Raider and did all these things and BPI building analysts so that I can learn more and, and I could be sound like I know what I'm talking about anyway. So in 2008, we, um, we, the council passed an ordinance, a green building ordinance. It was the first one in the region and it was the most comprehensive in the state in that it, we uh, required tier one compliance. I'm sorry, I'm mixing those up. We um, required it for all, all, resident, all projects, residential room additions, remodels, alterations. And because we didn't have Cal Green at the time, we adopted uh, Build It Green as our, uh, it's our rating system. We adopted that and we you know, would require thresholds based on the size of the house and the type of project it was. And uh, for non-res, we adopted uh, LEED. And we, we fell short of the LEED certification levels. This was kind of an introduction to green building. It's not something we'd done before. We'd done energy efficiency. But both of those, um, both Build It Green and the LEED, we required a 15% compliance margin. So it wasn't just we kind of coupled energy efficiency with the um, green building requirements. Um, and. In the, the uh, Build It Green part of it, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Build It Green, but it, it, um, we highlighted different areas, or the system, the program highlights areas that are, they see as the most important to comply with energy efficiency and, and water conservation and, and natural resource conservation. So that's kind of what we're, we're promoting using the Build It Green. Um, so that was in 2008. In 2011, State of California um, required all cities to adopt CalGreen. And so um, our, our approach was not to require compliance with two different uh, sustainability approaches, which would have been, you know, the lead and build it green on one side and CalGreen. So we rescinded the ordinance for um, lead, our green building ordinance for leading and build it green. And we adopted CalGreen tier one. And, and we are the only city in the state of California that adopted tier one. And uh, when it first came out, it was only applicable to new construction. We applied it to all construction projects except single trade permits. So um, we really did have the um, most comprehensive um, uh, green building ordinance in the state. And along with that, we also um, required the 10% compliance margin. Then moving on, uh, and um, those of you who I don't know, may or may not know about Cal Green, it's, um, it's not a rating system like LEED or like Build It Green. It's actually just a, a collection of best practices that should be incorporated into a project. But it, it was really um, fashioned after both Build It Green and LEED. So it, it addresses the same areas of you know, um, site selection and water conservation and energy conservation and natural resource conservation and, and indoor air quality, all the things that LEED and, and uh, Build It Green address. So then moving on to 2014, the city adopted a um, PV ordinance for all new single family dwellings. And, um, and then in uh, 2016 or thereabouts, there were a couple of projects that came before the council and there was a lot of discussion about uh, what kind of sustainability measures should be incorporated in these projects. So those were probably the first two uh, there was Nishi and the uh, uh, conference center on Richards and hotel. And so there was kind of this precedent set with um, lead gold equivalency. And um, the idea was that we, that these projects, you know, had to uh, demonstrate, you know, a level of, of uh, sustainability and energy efficiency and water efficiency, all these things that go along with that, um, that was acceptable to the community. And so that kind of set a precedent. And so when new projects came in, they, you know, there would be this expectation that they would c comply with lead gold equivalency. Well, there was a few things associated with lead gold equivalency. Well, lead gold, like John said, it's a really expensive process to get certified. Um, but our, our staff, and so, you know, there was a presumption that perhaps our staff could, could verify compliance, but I'm a lead AP, but I'm the only lead AP in, in the billing division, so our staff doesn't have the, um, the expertise to verify um, Lead, lead requirements. We know Cal Green, we know California Energy um, Code, and so um, again, we went back to this thing where should we, 
should we be pursuing two separate approaches for sustainability on the same project? So uh, we just actually um, recently passed an ordinance that was just a week ago, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, um, where we actually uh, eliminated that, that um, lead gold equivalency because it did cost extra money to have um, third party verification. What we did was we, we did analysis of lead requirements, Davis Municipal Code requirements, Cal Green requirements, Tier 1, and then the California Energy Commission with a 10% compliance margin. Kind of translated that into a score that would be, you know, equivalent to a score we'd receive in the lead, the lead um, system. And then we added some features that would get us to lead gold equivalency, and those were photovoltaics. So the, um, the, the ordinance requires um, the lesser of 80% offset of electricity use on site or uh, 15 watts per square foot of the um, solar ready roof, which is a solar ready roof is a, a term that's defined in the energy code. And it's about 15% of the roof. Um, and so there was also, like I said, 10% compliance margin. We also codified a, um, the City of Davis electrical vehicle charging uh, plan, which had previously been um, approved through council resolution, but we codified it and put it into the uh, municipal code. And we also, again, um, required the 10% compliance margin. So that was actually um, 2019, but I'm gonna go back to 2016 and the lead gold equivalency, because I kind of jumped a little bit. Um, so there was, even though these projects hadn't, have not been built still, um, that was kind of a precedent that was set. Um, in 2017, I think we actually took a really um, big step. And, and so, um, like John had mentioned, in 2020, January 2020, we're going to be going to basically zero net electricity in the um, state of California. And so the state of California's con Energy Commission is going to require that we have enough, enough uh, photovoltaics to offset the electricity, the model of electricity use in, in, the, um, in the building. And initially, the goal established a while ago, years ago, was to get to zero net energy by 2020. That's when um, Governor Schwarzenegger was in office. And so um, what they found was they, they couldn't quite get there. Anyway, so along the way, we've been planning for this, you know, 2020 zero net um, electricity, and so we thought that we would take a significant step between then and, and, and now to kind of an intermediate step. And so we were able to um, request and receive a cost effectiveness study that showed that 80% um, electricity offset with photovoltaics was cost effective in this climate zone. And also that single family dwellings, 30% uh, compliance margin, which in the past, all we've ever required is a 15% compliance margin on single family dwellings. So 30% compliance margin was cost effective in climate zone 12. And so um, for single family and for uh, multi, low rise multifamily, 25% uh, compliance margin. So um, that is the ordinance that was passed back in um, 2017. And that's the one that's in force now. And, um, like I said, in a few months, we're going to be going to um, zero net electricity and also changing the way that we, do we measure compliance, which is going to be the HERS scale, which is, is what John uses in Canada and what a lot of other, other states use. But California, we have our own way of doing things and have for a long time. And um, <clears throat> there are actually a, um, a number of things that are going on. Um, like uh, Brett said, I was uh, uh, am the chair of the Cal um, Calbo Energy Commission Advisory Committee, and about three or four years ago, I wrote a letter to Commissioner McAllister identifying a number of things that um, made it difficult to comply with the code, and um, the the relationship between between you know Calbo, California building officials, and the Energy Commission has been somewhat strained over the years, but. Um, I really, um, I don't know, Commissioner McAllister took it to heart and he's actually um, taken action on every single thing that, that we identified was potential barriers to um, compliance. And so the kind of the last thing that, that we're looking at is the actual formatting of the energy code. And, and they just recently, a few weeks ago, 
um, forwarded me a copy, a, a word copy of the energy code, which they haven't done before, in the, in the, um, so that we can, Calbo can work on reformatting it to make it um, consistent with all the other parts of Title 24, all the plumbing code, mechanical code, because it's written in a much different way, and it's, it's very difficult to navigate, and, and um, you know, a, a brand new inspector, you can, and you can take the plumbing code and, and ask a question about a water heater, and they can go to the index, and they could, you know, look it up and find it. You just, you can't do that in the energy code. The, in fact, it, you have to go to seven different places. This is an example I use. If you're going to install, replace a water heater, you literally have to go to seven different places in the code to get all the information that you need. And so um, they took it to heart, and, and um, they're allowing us to play around with our stuff, and they've changed the forms, and, and they've uh, reinstated the index. The index of the energy code went away in the late 90s. I don't know why. But um, they've agreed to reinstate the index. So um, I, think, I think, I don't know, we're, it seems like we're really on the verge of some really big changes. Um, you know, there's a lot of policy pressure to move towards zero net energy and, and uh, um, you know, deal with, with um, carbon and all these things. Like John, I'm kind of with John. I don't, I don't know what carbon is. I don't know how to measure carbon emissions, but I, I know how to measure energy efficiency. And so, like I said, I, th I think we're on the verge of some important changes. So, um, so uh, Judy uh, gave me uh, strict instructions to make sure that we had enough time for questions and answers. That's why, uh, okay, you know, no, I, I and, and so uh, are you uh, both willing to take some sure. questions from the audience? And uh, we'll uh, use the microphone for those of you who might have missed that little bit. Uh, this is being recorded so that other people can um, sort of watch this presentation. So even though it might seem quite comfortable to not ask the question with the microphone, uh, I will hand the microphone to you. Uh, just as a courtesy, if you could keep the question relatively short and concise, I believe the two gentlemen here will be available for uh, after this to perhaps answer more uh, longer sort of discussion-y sorts of questions. Uh, with that, uh, anybody have a question they would like to ask? So John, this is a question about Canadian builders and U.S. builders, I think. You were describing how can you, send, you, you, you put out a challenge and the, and the builders say, you know, we'll try to we'll rise up to it. And we've had the experience here more of, of trying to put out a challenge and having a lot of pushback from the, the builders that they can't, they won't, um, it's impossible. Do uh, you have any, any suggestions for why that is and how we might overcome it? Test. Okay. I, I'm actually going to say it's engagement. So, um, and I, I'm going to look over here. Well, well actually, I, I can uh, give a specific example. Uh, actually, uh, Eric Rowe uh, had a project before the council, uh, the live work units off of Fifth. And, uh, you know, one of the questions was about photovoltaic for the individual units, and that came up. And uh, there were some. Con uh, as he described it, there were some concerns about the roof orientation and sizing, which would make it uh, difficult so that for each unit to have its own sort of photovoltaic sort of array. Uh, so anyway, we approved the project, and uh, I, I will say that uh, about a month later, Eric reached out to me and said, hey, you know, you brought up that question. We've been doing some work, and actually it uh, looks like it's more feasible than not feasible. So I, I think your question is accurate that, in my experience, many, or perhaps most, are sort of reluctant. But I, I think there are some good examples in our community that when we approve something, the standards uh, aren't sort of the maximum they're going to try to do. They'll actually try to do even better than that. Um, but um, Yeah, so just quickly, I, I, I do mechanical designs. I do all sorts of other consulting. So. It, it really, a lot of my clients don't actually understand the code or the energy part of it. And they're small business people, so there's, there's this natural reluctance to, to do more. Uh, many times when we do these engagements, they find out it is doable, back to the point, 
and that's where we have the success. So it's just, it's bridging this gap. So I won't speak for John, but there are builders in town who choose, like, like Dick, who choose to build you know, far above the code and, and are not necessarily required to. And I don't, I don't know if you're, sounds like you're one of those who, who chooses to build, um, who wants to go above code. And so th they do exist. They're just, they're just uh, not all builders are, are that way. Uh, John and Greg, thank you for speaking tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Eric Rowe. I'm a local builder in Davis. Been doing so for about 25 years. And um, to help answer your question a little bit and pose a new one of my own, green building costs extra money than standard building. And oftentimes there's not the funding for that. It, the, the, if you build the house, you cannot sell it for that extra money you put into it. You need that unique buyer, that unique owner that wants those features. So if the city pushes for those features, those green building energy efficient features, it costs a builder more money to put those features in the house. And who's going to pay for that? Oftentimes the buyer or the owner is not willing to pay for that. They like to say, I have this wonderful energy efficient house, but they're not willing to pay for it. So that's, that's the disconnect. That's the challenge right there. Let's look at a Tesla automobile. You know, they're $100,000. That's what they were when they came out. Now they're cheaper. So the, the technology is improving. Things are getting cheaper. So if green building can continue to get cheaper and cheaper, then it's easier to, to require it, and it's easier for a builder to, to include it, and then it's a win-win situation. But things take time. So perhaps we've been in a, a situation of imbalance uh, in recent years or recent decades where we're pushing for these energy efficient features, but it, they, they hurt the feasibility of a project. And in communities like Davis or the, the wealthier areas of the Bay Area, people are, are, are green oriented. They have a little extra money and they're willing to do that. But if you look at other communities in California, maybe outside the cities, people don't have that extra money. So it's hard to to push or to require them to do that green building. Um, so th those are a couple of my thoughts. So hopefully Davis, California, the United States can continue to, to find affordable ways to push for that, that green building and green, build, green uh, materials become less expensive. Thank you. Can I respond to that? that um, so with my consulting hat on, I actually help builders market. And the, the first level of my engagement is I have to prove to you that I can save you money so you can pay me. That's the very first part of it. The second part of it is the huge innovation is educating people that they want to buy these things. And I'll pull a page from the book of the late great, and I'm just having a mental block about Steve Jobs. I got his name. It's, it's actually not a consumer's job to ask, it's, it's our job to sell. So some municipalities have let us, as an innovation, offer to sell people upgrade packages. And we're very successful on it. So there's a baseline of a certain percentage better than a model energy code. And then there's these other packages. And we usually have a 30 or 40 percent absorption rate. So back to your point, they pay for it and they understand the value of it but it's in educating them. It's making them aware of why they want it. So, so uh, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, I, I've noticed that uh, homes for sale in England, when you look, uh, just not, not even just brand new homes, but you know, uh, you just regular homes for sale, it has a expected energy cost per year. So people are able to look and go, oh wow, this is, and there's different alphabetical ratings, if my memory serves me correctly. And so people can look at almost these sort of two identical-ish houses and sort of in a quick thumbnail go, oh, wow, this one's just going to be so much cheaper to live in because it's just, you know, my yearly utility bill is only going to be half of what this other one is. Uh, does Canada have a, a similar sort of system so that as a home buyer, you have this metric that you can compare home to home? Yes, and so I didn't get to show the video. Um, but our building code lets us use a couple of different systems. 
If everybody wants to go to betterbuilder.ca, you can, you can see a video on there. And that's the importance of the index, right? So Greg's talking about these things. The ERI index is an international energy code index. The HERS index that I'm talking about is a verified rated number that's, that's very affordable for builders. Um, so yes, we do. Uh, the province that I'm in actually tried to, they were just very close to getting, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, it was an acronym, but um, people had to provide an energy rating at point of sale. And, and the issue sort of became that the real estate lobby lobbied for it, it not to happen. But again, um, uh, with this energy code coming in, if you start using this index, that's what you get. And it's, it's an ANSI verifiable monetized number. So getting back to, to doing this, to rating a home, um, and you have a great opportunity because the banks recognize that on a mortgage. They don't actually do that in Canada. So the appraisers actually recognize that better house as having lower operating costs. So uh, any other, wow, okay. So I'll go here, here, and then here, if that's okay. okay. <laughs> First of all, thanks to, to both of you. Greg, that was a wonderful summary of what's been happening with Davis Codes in, in this millennium, and I hadn't ever seen that all presented, and I was behind, so much appreciated. Um, John, we had a good time today talking, and that's, that's why you pointed at me several times. Talk, we talked <laughs> mostly technology. But um, one of the things that I saw a study on today, and, and it's kind of a repeat of a much bigger one that was done by the National Renewable Energy Lab, showed that as soon as a house is finished with a PV system on it, the, the value of the house increases by $10,000, by more than the cost of the PV. And I guess I feel like we too often lose sight of value increase when we're trying to do our economic analyses. But my real question to you is, is there any data similar to that in Canada? We get more sunshine here, so maybe they're less valuable where you are, but it's certainly been a trend all across the U.S. So the, the adverse happens, deck in Canada. Solar's considered a liability because there's more in insurance that goes along with that. So what I'm working hard on is, is getting appraisers to recognize that as an asset, just like you're talking about, that, that solar on a roof is actually something that buys people disposable income to offset operating costs. But you're way further ahead in, um, in the United States than we are in Canada. Um, our programs in Canada, basically in a nutshell, and this is rather sarcastic, I'll prepare you for it, is paying people to do things that they should be doing for themselves anyways. There's all sorts of grants and programs and handouts and people get dependent on that. I, I wish we could really just get that house that he builds recognized as being better with the solar on it and, and actually monetizing the value of that when an appraiser goes. It's the appraisers that decide whether there's value there. Well, really, it's the buyers in, in the end, but the appraisers have to track pretty well, well what buyers want. So if a buyer goes to back to the bank, I, I agree with you, but if the buyer goes to the bank and the bank says that doesn't have any value, that's got no value. And that's just starting. There's a registry here in the States. But again, there's this interesting thing in, happening in California where we, we haven't been using the index. And, and I go through this all the time with builders. They tell me how great they are, and then I go out and look at their houses or I test their mechanical systems, and then they actually hire me to help them, you know, sort of fix it or do better designs. But I have to show them my value. And so this thing about the index is very important because you haven't been rating your houses. You don't know really how to determine what a net zero house is. We have people using that terminology without getting a verification. So hopefully we can do this on, on one house and sort of see how it, it settles out, right? Hi, <clears throat> I have a 50 year old house. I have blown in a ton of insulation. I put foil in my attic. I put in two whole house fans. I put in a white roof. 
but the house heating bill is terrible because there's no solar gain in the winter. So my next step is to basically pull off the drywall, put it in insulation. But that's not going to benefit. It's better just to pay the heating bill than to basically upgrade the house. So, and the, the, the buyer I sell it to will never know that my house is basically a money, a money, a money sink because, I, because the gas bill goes out, because the gas bill is, is really obscene. So the question is, why couldn't the city force me and other people to disclose our gas bills, our electric bill, and our water bill on resale? Just disclose the actual bill. Is there any state law that would, would, would on the resale inspection, we have a process. Is there any reason we couldn't do that? That's the question for the city and the question for the mayor. I think you can ask for it. Um, during a transaction, the last house I bought, I asked for the um, utility bills. There is a, um, there was an appraiser that I know, she was trying really hard to get that to be part of the sale, is to disclose information about the energy use of the house. And yeah, the real estate market, they are the real estate industry, they fight things like that. I, I was a real estate agent for a short time, and there was a willful ignorance about problems and houses and whatnot. You didn't want to know anything, you didn't disclose it. I was told by the lawyer for Lion Real Estate, never ever as an agent look up the sexual offender registry. Because if you know that someone lives by, you have to tell it. So you never, so you never ask questions. So, that, so if your house has a problem, you never just dis disclose it. It's a, a across the board disclosure would do that. So it would be a way of forcing the real estate agency to actually disclose problems. So uh, Alan, you worked for Lion Real Estate? L Lion Real Estate. OK. I actually just sold, sold my house, and I disclosed that it took a long time for hot water to get to the master bath. Actually, I had a really expensive um, on-demand um, pump that I took with me when I, when I went. <laughs> because <laughs> it was not disclosed to me. I mean, literally, four and a half minutes for hot water to get to the, the master bath faucet. And I, you know, I spent about $800 installing. The, actually, the first one cost me about $250, and that one failed. So I bought a much more expensive one that worked really well. And so I took it with me and disclosed that it takes a long time for hot water to get. Um, so again, I, I'd say it's, it's consumer awareness and buyer beware. But again, uh, back to somebody who's making the comment, in, in Europe, they have the energy label. Um, th that's the easiest way to do it, is to require whatever the house is at is to require uh, an index on it. And um, it's, it's not somebody making up the number, it's somebody following a prescribed ANSI standard. So, and, and that's what hers is, or that's what the ER, ERI number's about. And so the state of California actually has hers um, to verification, in which it is an audit that places you on that chart, on that scale. And, and so there was the, what, there was a thought by the Energy Commission that that would be, become part of a sale, is that you know, auditors would, you, or you could use it as a marketing tool where an auditor could come in and say, this is how this house rates on this scale, and you could use it as a, a marketing tool. Um, it hasn't really gained a lot of traction, and, and so, and one of the reasons is that depending on who does it, you know, it costs, probably more than a few hundred dollars to have someone go out there and do an audit, so. Great. Hi, uh, Tom Phillips. I uh, worked on green buildings and indoor quality for the state of California for years and, and advised build it green and then uh, helped develop um, the indoor quality things, but also more recently working on climate adaptation and resilience measures. LEED, as you may know, has the pilot measures uh, we got a, a little one in Build a Green also for climate adaptation and resilience. Um, so my first question, and, and I sent you an email. Yeah, and I got it, and I got answers for you. Okay, yeah. so we can talk about that later. <laughs> but, but the basic point is that Canada is doing some good stuff to look at future climate and weather files and, and use that to factor into the increased, say, cooling demand and wind and rain and other issues over the life of the building because we know it's changing so fast now that we need to aim 50 or 100 years ahead. Um, and Vancouver's doing that, I believe, and, yep. and the, the National Research Council has several projects to, to develop that. It's moving more slowly here in the US. Um, so I guess um, I would just ask you about um, things like uh, Passive House and other projects uh, and approaches that are already going 
near zero energy with, without uh, just really good design and construction. They have a CO2 metric that they calculate. And California is going to move that way. So I don't know if you realize that, but as of like last summer, they were talking about it. Yesterday, they set it in a workshop. The new metric um, for the new building standards cycle is going to be based carbon based. Um, and so that's doable. They have to work out the details. They've just updated their weather files because the last five years were historically hot. They're going to also work on developing future weather files. Uh, so I guess, um, have you s seen, uh, uh, I've followed the Passive House stuff. It seems to be growing in Canada, and they, I think they can go all electric, uh, at least in the urban areas, and they survived the Arctic uh, uh, cyclone or whatever you call it, the, the bombs and so on, you know, with power outages and maybe battery backup. And how that relates to California is that we're going to have climate like Phoenix by mid-century. And there's already a, a production builder there doing market-based single-family homes, uh, net zero. They're do, doing near passive house, super airtight, efficient, with, and they can downsize all the heat pumps, the PV system, and they, now they can afford batteries. And they, can also, they also get utility subsidies because it's all grid tight. So that's already doable. Now, Davis should be doing that now and then, and also reducing carbon even beyond that. And so that's my, my question to Davis and Canada. How do we take basically this technology, high performance buildings already out there, there's big projects, and how do we go beyond that? Because we're in an emergency situation with climate change, basically. We've got 10 years. <laughs> no, I, I agree. So. I do have quite a bit of experience with Passive House. And the interesting thing of Passive House is it actually came from California. It was called the Locale House. And the Germans sort of put their name on it, and then it came back. So when I was over in Germany looking at Passive Houses, and I've, I've actually helped build one in our climate, it's very specific to climate. So the idea of passive house is to get the house to basically heat itself. And it's uh, very airtight. Uh, the houses that we're building now are equally as airtight. Um, it, it focuses on minimizing thermal bridging and conduction, which is really a cold climate thing. So there's... Uh, Again, you guys have the best stuff. It's ASHRAE 90.2. Um, and Greg talked about this um, undertaking that you have to do to prove cost benefit. ASHRAE 90.2 does that. And it's just in its draft form. Um, so I saw a presentation when I was at a conference. Um, so in, in this climate, it's more about the types of windows you use rather than thermal insulation. Yeah, and I was in a building today and I saw something I've never seen before where there was vertical shades on the west side of the window, which makes a lot of sense. I hadn't done that before. If you're asking me about, about passive house and energy intensity, the houses that I work on are equally as good as that. The, all these things are measurement tools, and they're all very important. In Canada, there's not that many passive houses built. Um, so my philosophy is to try and catch the mainstream. So I want to have an influence over 10,000 houses instead of 100 houses. So I'm doing everything I can with baby steps to try and bring it into the middle, right? We need those passive houses to show people the possibilities, but the builders that I work for, both production and custom production and custom builders, um, that's a long way for them to go. So uh, actually, so I would this, say uh, seems nine, like ninety point uh, two. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I've been asked to make sure that we sort of end uh, roughly on time, and I think uh, 
there'll be plenty of time in the next few minutes to have a more in-depth conversation about some of these details. I just wanted to thank uh, the Davis Futures Forum again for uh, hosting this event and, and thank you very much for uh, coming. Oh, my, my and uh, I, I, I will, uh, on behalf of my colleagues on the City Council, uh, accept the challenge that uh, um, the Canadian... Uh, I'm just having to go out a little bit on a limb, assuming that they will uh, be supportive of this. But I will probably reach out to Eric Rowe and uh, you and uh, Greg and some of the people in the audience to help us figure out you know, how we do this. I can say that we do offer density bonuses and various other things for developers to incentivize them to do the right things in other areas. So I don't see why we couldn't do something like that for something that heads in this direction. Uh, but thank you once again, and if you're open to it, I, I, I do know that there are several people in the audience who would like to yes, talk sir. with you further. Uh, Judy, did you want to say anything in closing, or we... Uh... Thank you so much to all three of you. So anyway, thank you, uh, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>